me turn it over to the keynote speaker tonight. Mark Zandi is the chief economist for Moody's Analytics, where he directs economic research. I'm sure you've seen his, his work over many years. Dr. Zandi's recent research is, research is focused on mortgage finance reform and the detriments of mortgage foreclosure and personal bankruptcy. He's analyzed the economic impact of various tax and government spending policies and assessed the appropriate monetary policy response in bubbles in asset markets. He's the author, here's the plug for the book, ready? He's the author of Paying the Price, Ending the Great Recession and Beginning the American, New American Century, and Financial Shock, a 360 degree look at the subprime mortgage implosion and how to avoid the next crisis. Critical work in understanding the risks of the past um, to let us avoid those risks in the future. So I, I think that uh, clearly a thought leader on this topic. Dr. Zandi earned his BS from Wharton degree of, of school, business school at University of Pennsylvania. His PhD from Pennsylvania as well, and lives with his wife and three children in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I believe an Eagles fan. Um, I was gonna make a Super Bowl joke. I couldn't, I couldn't come up with a Patriots joke, but look, if we need deflation for scoring, then let deflation come. Oh. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Zandi. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. That was very kind of you. Um, yeah, I'm an Eagles fan. Fair weather, I have to say, though. Um, actually, um, I was born in Atlanta. Uh, my dad was, uh, was his family lore. I don't know if it's true. Maybe somebody should look it up. But um, he says he was the first PhD graduate in civil engineering from Georgia Tech in 1959. Could that be true? Could that be true? I'll have to look that up. But he um, became a professor at Penn, and that's how I ended up in Philadelphia. Actually, my very first speech as an economist was in Atlanta, probably 30, 35 years ago, to a group of accountants, as I recall. And I remember somebody coming up and asking if they should invest in property near Hartsfield International Airport. Uh, I don't remember what I said. Uh, what I yeah, just to, for sake of disclosure, in addition to um, being chief economist of Moody's, I'm on the board of directors of MGIC. It's a large publicly traded mortgage insurer. And I'm the lead director of uh, Reinvestment Fund. Reinvestment Fund is a community development financial institution, one of the largest in the country, and we actually make a lot of investments in Atlanta, in underserved communities in Atlanta. So, we have an office here in Atlanta. And, uh, so I have a lot of connections to, to Atlanta. Uh, but thank you for having me. Thank you for the two hours. That's kind of you. <laughs> no, nothing worse than an economist for what? 25, 30 minutes. And then I think we have time for a QA. and a We can turn it back to the group. See uh, what we want to talk about. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my talk, my prepared remarks uh, have really three parts to them. Uh, part one, uh, just a quick assessment of how things are going in uh, the near-term outlook. And when I say near-term, I, I mean 2019 for the remainder of the year. And bottom line, um, we've gotten off to a bit of a wobbly start, but 2019 should be a pretty good year, okay year. Not quite as strong in terms of growth as 2018. Last year, we were all juiced up by uh, the tax cuts. Uh, deficit finance tax cuts, the fiscal stimulus, and that's wearing off, but 2019 should be pretty good. And so I'll let you soak that in, uh, the optimism. And then uh, part two is uh, what could go wrong uh, in the near term, and we can talk about those Pac-Man a little bit, uh, Matt, the geopolitical risks, and I'll rank order the, how about if I give you the top three concerns that I have for, for 2019 that could derail things. And then uh, part three, um, I guess the key question, uh, the next recession. You want to know when the next recession is? I'm going to tell you the exact day of the next recession. Yeah. Everyone have a pen? Yeah, You've got to write this down. How does that sound? Is that a pretty good game plan? Is that okay? We can, we can talk about those eagles. But, yeah, okay. All right. <clears throat> part one. Uh, how are we doing? Uh, pretty good, not bad. Um, uh, when I think about the economy, my, the first thing I look at, the first place I go, is the job market, the labor market. Uh, that would, that's what matters most to most people. Uh, and it's a very good contemporaneous indicator of what's going on. And 
Job market is strong. Um, the last labor market report from the BLS came out, I think it was last Friday. Uh, we created over 300,000 jobs in the month of January. That is a lot of jobs. Now, that, that number overstates the case. That was before the polar vor vortex. Did that hit Atlanta, the polar vortex? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty brutal. But th that uh, was before the polar vo vortex. And uh, government shutdown really didn't have a big impact on, obviously, it was it was catastrophic for the 800,000 government workers that got furloughed uh, and several hundred thousand contract workers, but didn't seem to have an impact, at least not a measurable impact on the labor market outside of, of government. So 300,000 jobs is a lot of jobs. We created two, two and a half million last year, two and, a, two and a half million jobs last year, about the same as the year before, the year before that, the year before that. We're actually in the, the midst of the uh, longest string of monthly job gains in economic history. And we have economic data all the way back into the uh, 1920s. So, you know, uh, almost 100 years worth of data. And we've not ever seen a period of consecutive monthly job growth as long as the, as the current period. In fact, uh, just another uh, gee whiz statistic, if this economic expansion continues for another, I think it's four or five months until June, it will become the longest economic expansion in U.S. economic history over 10 years, even beating the expansion of the late 1990s. When you're creating all that, when you're creating 300,000 jobs, let's say that overstates the case, let's say we're creating a couple hundred thousand jobs uh, on a sustained basis. Uh, that is, that's a lot of jobs. That's, uh, that means you're creating all kinds of jobs, uh, low paying jobs, uh, leisure hospitality jobs, middle paying jobs, construction, manufacturing, uh, high paying jobs, uh, professional services. In fact, it's, it's easier to list the, comp the, the industries that are not adding to payrolls, uh, really three. One is uh, brick and mortar retail, right, because that's Amazon and other internet retailers are really cleaning brick and mortar guys. Uh, print media. Uh, small industry, but you know that's getting reamed by uh, the online comp competition. And more recently, mortgage banking, right? Because mortgage rates rose last year, knocked the wind out of the housing market, certainly killed refinancing activity, and so mortgage bankers are adjusting to that. But that's it. Every other industry in the economy is uh, creating a, a lot of jobs. 200,000 jobs is double the rate of growth in the labor force. So that's the number of people that are coming in each month looking for work. We're creating 200, 100,000 are coming in. That means we're uh, seeing unemployment, underemployment continue to decline. We're pulling people that are out of the labor force or have been out of the labor force, not looking for work, therefore not counted as unemployed. They're coming back in. Um, and uh, the uh, un un unemployment, underemployment rate continue to climb. We're at a 4% unemployment rate, and everything suggests that it's going to continue to fall into the mid, mid threes. So if you invite me back next year to this function, we should be at a close to 3.5% unemployment rate. We've been at this, uh, in the 3% unemployment range twice in history. Once was in World War II, we were in the threes. Uh, the other time was in the early 1950s. Anyone remember what happened in the early 1950s? <clears throat> the only reason I know this is because I'm reading the uh, David McCullough biography of Truman. Anyone read that biography? Don't. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a thousand pages. I think it's literally a thousand pages, maybe 998 pages. I'm one of these people who, you know, I can't read the next book until I finish the book I'm on, and I've been reading this book now for three years, so it's like... <laughs> I know everything you'd ever want to know about the Truman Library, really, every painting, I know. Uh, anyway, I, I know the early 1950s now, that was the Korean War, the Korean War. We had 10% of the American workforce on the Korean Peninsula, and that was the last time we've had unemployment as low as we have today. Um, other statistics, the quit rate, that's the percent of the labor force that's quitting their jobs. Obviously, you don't do that unless you think you can find another one. That's pretty close to record highs and demographically adjusted, age adjusted. It is at a record high because you know we have a lot of baby boomers my age out there in their 50s and 60s and you don't tend to move when you're in your 50s and your 60s. So if you adjust for that, we quit rates are at record highs. Um, and, the, and wage growth is accelerating uh, as you would expect. There was some debate a year or two or three ago about where's the wage growth. 
you know, why aren't we seeing more uh, wage growth? Well, it's here. It's in the data. Wage growth is now firmly over 3% and accelerating, given that inflation is 2%. That means real wage growth is 1, 1 plus. That's pretty good. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's the folks in the bottom part of the income distribution that are seeing the biggest increase in wages. That's where the labor market is tightest. Of course, we've had some increases in minimum wage in different parts of the country, and that's lifting wages as well. This is the number one reason to be optimistic about the economy going forward. We are in, a, in the virtuous part of the business cycle. That is, lots of jobs, falling unemployment, low unemployment, causing wage growth to accelerate. That stronger wage growth is the fodder for consumer spending. American consumers drive the economic trains. In fact, if the American consumer is out buying things, and we are, we not only drive our economy, but we drive the entire global economy. We have a $600 billion a year annual trade deficit, and you know we're, we buy everything we produce and everything, a lot of what everyone else produces in the rest of the world. So as long as the American consumer is doing their thing, the rest of the world should be OK. Uh, and of course, businesses see that, and they hire more, and unemployment declines. And you can see how we're now in this nice, self-reinforcing, virtuous part of the business cycle. Uh, of course, this part of the business cycle comes to an end, and I'll tell you when it will come to an end, but it's pretty hard to break. Uh, you have to really work hard to break it, and we are trying to break it. We're doing everything we can to try to break it in Washington, but um, it's pretty hard to break. And so, at least for 2019, I think we're in pretty good shape. That virtuous cycle should uh, continue to prevail, and we should be in pretty good shape. How are you feeling? You want me to give you another reason for optimism before I move on to the dark side? Okay. All right, one more reason for optimism. Uh, for the bankers in the room uh, and the folks that provide credit, credit is flowing freely. Um, the banking system is in fabulous shape. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, capital levels, they've never been higher. Uh, the banks have done a lot of hard work. Folks here in SunTrust, and now I understand BB&T is going to be a neighbor, a uh, closer neighbor, I guess. Um, uh, they've go gone out and raised a lot of capital since the, the financial crisis 10 years ago. Liquidity is very strong. Um, risk management is very good. They, you know, they listen to me, so they, they're in pretty good shape. Uh, everything should be fine. If they listen to, listen to my forecast, we'll, be, we'll do, do pretty good. Uh, Profitability is very strong. You know, p post the tax cut, last year's tax cut, return on assets, return on equity is about as strong as it's ever been uh, in the data. So the banking system is very highly capitalized and very profitable. And that means that credit is flowing. The credit environment is very good. Credit quality is excellent uh, across all asset classes. So uh, Matt talked a little bit about the household sector. Households are in very good shape. You know, there are pockets of of issues, subprime vehicle, student lending obviously is an issue for, for millennials. Um, some concerns about cards, but you know, these are really on the margin. In aggregate, the household sector is in very good shape. Uh, corporate sector, pretty good. I'm going to come back to that in the context of some of the risks and, th and threats, but uh, something we need to watch. But credit quality, CNI loan credit quality, very good. The charge offs, very low. CRE, commercial real estate. Uh, residential mortgage, I was looking at data from the Federal Reserve on uh, uh, charge-off rates for residential mortgage, and they're negative. And it's negative because uh, banks and other lenders are, rec uh, are recovering more uh, than they're losing, and so their net charge-off rate is, is actually negative. So uh, the credit environment looks, looks good, uh, and, and as, la as long as the banking system, the financial system continues to provide credit, uh, the economy, it's, you know, obviously credit's the mother's milk of economic activity. As long as, as credit's flowing, uh, the economy should, should be in pretty good shape. Too much credit's a problem, obviously. That was, you know, what was behind the financial crisis 10 years ago. Not enough credit is also a problem. That was the credit crunch in the wake of the financial crisis. But if you look at credit growth today, it's right in the sweet spot, you know, very close to the growth in GDP, profitability, and income. Uh, and we're in good shape. Uh, so. 2019, all the hand-wringing about recession, 2019, uh, overdone. Uh, uh, this year should be a, a pretty good year. Again, not quite as good as, as 2018 in terms of growth because the fiscal stimulus is fading. The tax benefit of the tax cuts is going away. 
but uh, even abstracting from that, uh, we're in pretty good shape. Okay, that's the end of part one. That's, uh, that's uh, pretty happy, right? Feeling pretty good. Okay, okay part two, uh, what could go wrong? Um, and here I'm really focused on what could go wrong in the most immediate future. Let me rank order, I'll give you my top three concerns rank ordered chronologically. Uh, I, if, if I was in this room a month ago, obviously the government shutdown would have been at the top of the list. Uh, you know, we obviously still some uncertainty around that, but I'd be pretty shocked if uh, the administration, the Trump administration and Congress don't get it together and keep government open. Uh, that seemed like a pretty significant uh, political loss for the president. I can't imagine he's going to go down that path again. So I, I don't think that's, that's not in my top three. I mean, obviously that, that's front and center in terms of timing. We've got to, they've got to figure this out in the next week or two, but uh, I think they will. So what's at the top of the list? Well, number one uh, would be the trade war. Um, now, now here, sort of my, in my baseline optimism about the economy, my view is that, you know, the president will figure this out. Uh, that, um, you know, push comes to shove. If it looks like the stock market is weakening because of the trade war, if it looks like it's doing real damage to the economy, uh, then the president will find a way to strike an arrangement with Xi, uh, President Xi of China, and we get a deal. Uh, it's just a matter of time and timing. Not, not that I expect anything much to come out of this. I really don't think the trade deal we're going to get with China is going to significantly address the underlying problems we have with China. You know, uh, IP, stealing IP, uh, the ability to invest in Chinese companies, uh, cyber espionage. You know, there's a slew of things that, you know, obviously need to be uh, addressed. Uh, not that I really think we're going to make any progress there, but at the end of the day, I do think the president uh, will take this only so far and he will stop as soon as it looks like it's any doing any significant damage to the to the stock market uh, and, to, and to the economy. Um, you know, the kind of the roadmap here is the North American free trade deal. You, that was, uh, he, he struck a deal with Mexico and Canada uh, back at the end of last year at the last minute. You know, that's much ado about nothing. When you, when you look at the deal, nothing really changed. The biggest change in the deal was content rules about vehicle production in the United States, but the vast, vast majority of Mexican vehicles that come over the border already satisfy those content rules. So in the cars that don't, the penalty would be a couple percent higher tariff. So really from a financial perspective, no big deal. Yes, the Canadians lowered you know, the restrictions on dairy products from the US into Canada, but the Canadians gave that to us anyway uh, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal. They had already given up on that. In fact, they're very happy to give up on that. Uh, they want cheaper U.S. dairy products. But that's it. That's the sum total of the changes that came out of the uh, of this deal for uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement. In fact, I refuse to call it anything other than NAFTA. It is it is NAFTA. Remember the EU deal, the deal with the European Union? Uh, you may have forgotten, but we were in a war with them back last summer. We struck a the president struck a deal with them, and. Uh, again, much of do about nothing. They were supposed to buy more soybeans from us, but they were never going to buy soybeans from us because our soybeans are all GMO. They would never buy them anyway, so uh, it's not happening. Uh, that's what's going to happen with the China deal, but <clears throat> it's just a matter of time. <clears throat> so that's my baseline. Of course, there's a lot of risk around that. Uh, these are big personalities uh, that uh, you know, both the, uh, President Trump and President Xi. Uh, and, you know, you can easily construct a scenario where things actually do go off the rails and they can't uh, come to terms and they will do damage to our economies. And it's not like, uh, it's not doing some damage. Take a look at the Chinese economy. It's really sucking a lot of wind. Now, a big part of that is related to their crackdown on credit cards. Remember I said, you know, credit is the mother's milk of economic activity and they crack down on credit growth to address their leverage issues and that's done a lot of damage to their economy, but also layered on top of that, is this trade war starting to have an impact? And here in the United States, there's fingerprints of the trade war on our economy. It, it's performing well, but go take a look at business investment. 
Remember, business investment was supposed to take off after the tax cut. We were going to get businesses a big tax cut, and then we're going to go out, and we're going to see this major sustained revival in business investment. That has not happened. There's been no change in investment spending, even including what's going on in the energy sector, since last summer. And my guess is, my sense is, that the trade war with China is having an impact. If you're a large multinational corporation, and you can't figure out whether the next move on tariffs is to go from 10% to 25 or 10% to zero, your natural instinct is going to be not to do anything. And you'll just, it's not gonna, you're not going to cut back on investment, but you're certainly not going to add to it. So uh, there's a lot of risk around this, and uh, we'll have to watch. But again, uh, the baseline, uh, my optimism is based in the assumption that the president will do whatever is necessary to avoid a full-blown knockout trade war that will do damage to both economies. So that's at the top of the list. Second, and this is in chronological order, because he has come, the trade deals are trying to negotiate towards March 1st. They're not, it doesn't look like they're going to get that, but you know, sometime in the spring, early summer. <clears throat> Next up, uh, risk number two, the uh, Treasury debt limit. You remember the Treasury debt limit? <clears throat> this is this anachronistic uh, law we have that says the Treasury can't issue debt above a certain amount. Right, and obviously that's a problem because we run these huge budget deficits and our debt load is rising daily. You know, for example, this year our budget deficit is going to come in somewhere close to a trillion dollars, in large part because of those tax cuts and increase in government spending, all deficit finance. And so uh, we are going to hit the debt limit very soon. In fact, the debt limit was actually suspended last year because they couldn't come to terms on it for a year. And that suspension ends on March 1st. Everything seems to be happening on March 1st. I don't know why that is, but that seems to be like the key day. Now, the Treasury has cash in its, uh, that it can play around with for a while to pay bills. Uh, and you know, of course, the April tax filings will have a big impact on how much cash they have on hand. But if you do a little bit of a calculation here and look at history, it looks like the Treasury is going to run out of cash probably sometime in September. In, you know, uh, you know, maybe late August, maybe early September, somewhere in there. Uh, and so we need a piece of legislation that is passed by Congress and signed by the president raising that debt limit. Now that sounds pretty easy, but obviously that's very, very difficult to do in the context of all the political dysfunction. And the thing that makes me, you know, in my baseline optimism, I'm thinking, oh yes, they're definitely going to sign and raise the debt limit in time and no big deal. Uh, life goes on. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen this movie before, and it ends all. It ends the same way. You, you know, we kind of get right up to the cliff, and before we go over the cliff, then you know, uh, we we sign on the dotted line. But I have to say, I, I am a little worried about it because um, there is a growing chorus of vo voices wondering whether we could actually get on the other side of the debt limit without causing a lot of damage. So, for example, I testified in Congress a few months ago to a committee. Uh, around the debt limit issue, and uh, there's this uh, congressman, the senator from Kentucky, Rand Paul, interesting fellow, very smart, you know, very smart guy, very highly articulate, but you know, just crazy. Uh, he's, he's thinking about, you know, openly considering, you know, what would happen and debating, the, you know, me and, and other folks that look at do this for a living. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't really think that's a big deal. I think we can get on the other side of this. Uh, I don't think global investors are going to really care. Well, that's just nuts. Uh, I mean, actually, there's a great case study here. Believe it or not, in the 1970s, you have to go all the way back to the 1970s, the Treasury actually missed a debt payment. It was a technical error, a computing error. This is in the infancy of the computer, the mainframe computer. They actually, uh, uh, the computer had a glitch you know, we had glitches, you know, it was Fortran programming probably, and didn't have the Fortran coder on hand, and we had a glitch, and the payment was like, you know, a few hours late to investors. So, of course, economists love these kinds of things because this is a natural experiment, right? We, you can go and take a look at what happened, and it's very clear that that glitch cost us an enormous amount of money. I mean, because investors were nervous after that that they wouldn't get their money on time. Right, and every hour, every penny matters. You know, you tell me your investment matters. You know, you want your money now. If you told me I'm gonna get my money now, I want it now. And if you don't give it to me, that's a problem. Uh, and and by the way, if you don't give it to me now, I'm gonna think next time you're not gonna give it to me on time. So you go look at it. It costs us billions of dollars just because of that simple thing. So if we go on the other side of the debt limit, and 
uh, you know, test this theory, I, I fear that it's going to cost us, for generations it's going to cost us. I mean, we are the Lannisters, right? We pay our debts, you know, we pay our debts. And that is one of the bedrocks of the global financial system. And if we don't pay our debts on time, it's going to rock the financial system and rock the U.S. economy. So, you know, that sounds pretty convincing, right? So we're going to, they're going to sign on the dotted line, right? So I, I would think, but you know, obviously a lot of risk about that. Okay, let me give you one more risk and we're going to move on to part three chronologically. And this is Brexit. I know you don't care, right? You don't really care about Brexit. You probably should. Uh, you probably should care about Brexit. Um, you know, here my, my baseline view is uh, they'll get it together just in, in the nick of time. What the nick of time is is not clear anymore. I mean, at the moment, the drop dead date for Brexit is March 29th, uh, but it feels like uh, the British uh, are going to figure out a way to kick the can down the road. So it's not actually going to be a March deadline, maybe it's a June or September deadline, or maybe it's never, right? They keep kicking the can down the road and to the point when the millennials actually gain control of government and then they never Brexit or something like that. Uh, but let's say the deadline is sometime this year. My sense is that, you know, I'm an economist. I think everything's economics. The economics are here are pretty clear. You know, no deal doesn't make any sense. And the deal that uh, Theresa May, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, put forward seems pretty rational. You know, it gives the Brexiters everything they wanted except for one thing. Everything they got, they got, they got control over their borders, how much immigrants come into the country, how many immigrants come into the country, they could control over the court system. All service trade is going to be bespoke. They're going to cut free trade deals so the financial services industry is going to, you know, try to figure it out with the EU, the European Union, and to work it out. The only thing they didn't get, the Brexiters didn't get, was uh, a breakaway on the trade in goods. Uh, and here they couldn't do it because if they did that, then there'd have to be, given the technology, a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. So uh, Theresa May says, well, let's just not worry about that. We'll stay in the customs union. We, don't need a, we won't therefore need a wall. We'll, we'll stay with the EU on goods trade until we can get a technology or somehow we figure this out and we all move forward. So the Brexiters are obviously are not, they, you know, they, they should be happy with it. They're not. They want everything. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think they're going to take what they got and call it a day and move forward. Because if you look at the poll numbers, uh, if they had another referendum, they'd lose badly. So my baseline optimism, I mean, my baseline optimism, I'm thinking that they'll come to terms. You know, maybe not on March 29th, but sometime this year, life goes on. But obviously, a lot of risk around that, a lot of big personalities involved, and a lot of parties involved. It's not just the British, but it's also the European Union, and we need to watch this very carefully. Not that if there was even a, you go down the darkest path, not even if there was a no deal scenario, uh, no deal, and they actually busted through, and uh, there would be chaos in, in UK and EU. I don't think it would land us in recession, but it obviously would change the trajectory of this economy quite significantly and therefore something to watch. So those are the top three concerns I have, all geopolitical, you know, here and now in, in 2019. Okay. How are you feeling now? Okay, now we're going to get to, I am the economist with the two hands. I gave you the one hand, the optimism, and it's all about the dark side. So, uh, uh, and in fact, I, you know, I look at my audience, I try to gauge how happy you are. And if you're, you're happy, I generally give you more happiness. If you're, if you're not happy enough, I give you more happiness, but you look too happy, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you down. So let's talk about the next recession. <clears throat> the best, part three, the next recession. Everyone got a pen? Okay. So the best leading indicator of recession is when the economy passes through full employment. Now, there's a lot of debate as to what's full employment, but the best estimate, the consensus view, the Fed view, CBO view, consensus of economists, my view, is that a 4.5% unemployment rate is roughly consistent with full employment. Now, that implies a higher level of precision than I'd like to give, but let's go with that, 4.5%. Uh, we're now at 4%. And remember what I said, this year should be a pretty good year, and unemployment will continue to decline. If we're back in this room a year from now, my, my sense is that we'll be close to 3.5%. So we'll be a full percentage point below uh, full employment. 
the reason why that's such a good leading indicator is uh, if you go past full employment, uh, it is totological by definition that you have to come back to full employment, otherwise the economy overheats, right? You're past full employment, wage growth accelerates, ultimately price pressures develop, inflation, the Federal Reserve responds by raising interest rates, long-term rates ultimately rise, and the economy ultimately breaks. And uh, the, the thing is, once if you go past full employment, the more you go past full employment, the harder it is to get back without, without actually going into recession because you risk going from a virtuous cycle, the cycle that we're in, into what I would call a vicious cycle. Unemployment starts to rise. A very different environment, right? Think about that. What kind of job growth would you need for unemployment to start to rise? Remember I said you get 100,000 uh, uh, people coming in the labor force every month? So that, that's an economy with, with job growth below 100K. We're at 200K, we go below 100K, and that unemployment starts to rise. Once that starts to happen, people feel that. You know that right away. You sense it right away, right? You're a consumer. You pull back a little bit on your spending. Not a lot at first, but a little bit. Businesses see that. They pull back on their hiring. Unemployment rates start to rise some more. And you can see how you can go into that, into that vicious cycle. The other way you're thinking about this, the other kind of metaphor for this is you hear this all the time about this point, at this point in the business cycle, that the Federal Reserve is trying to land the plane on the tarmac, right? Land the economic plane. You've heard this metaphor, right? And the idea is you, the Fed is, we're, the, 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 the plane is the economy, the Fed is the pilot, the knobs on the front of the plane are the tools, the interest rates, quantitative easing, you know, whatever, uh, bank capital standards, stress testing, all the things they have control over. And if you go past, full employment, they're trying to land that plane on full employment without crash landing the plane, right? So they're trying to soft land the economy. You've heard that phrase. The problem is the Fed has never soft landed the economy, never. It came pretty close in the late 1990s in the technology boom, the internet boom, because they had kind of a, a headwind in guiding the plane. That was called productivity growth. We had tremendous productivity gains because of information technology and the internet. That kept inflation very depressed, and that allowed them to kind of navigate the plane down, and they got pretty close, but we crashed, remember? 2000, 2001 was a recession. Now this go around, they might have a little bit of a headwind as well. Inflation is very low. There's these broad structural forces keeping inflation down, so they have a little bit more room, and you can feel it. They just paused in raising interest rates, right? So they have a little bit of room to maneuver here, and maybe they, they can land the plane without crashing it, but if history is any guide, uh, they won't. So here's, here's the, the best long leading indicator of recession is when you pass full employment. The average length of time between when you pass full employment and go into recession is three years. We went through a four and a half, we passed through four and a half percent unemployment. That's the rate consistent with full employment in the summer of 2017. Summer of 2018, summer of 2019, summer of 2020. Next best leading indicator of recession is when the yield curve, the, sh the difference between long-term interest rates and short-term interest rates, which is normally positively sloped, meaning long rates are higher than long rates, when that yield curve inverts, when short rates rise above long rates, which is very rare, you got a problem and recessions ensue. Now, there's a lot of debate about this one as well. You know, we've got a lot of economists out there, including the Federal Reserve, saying, oh, well, this time's a little bit different, and here's the reasons why, you know, QE, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but don't pay attention. Don't pay, if I, even if, if I start telling you the QE, that the, the interest rate, that the yield curve doesn't matter, don't pay attention to me. Don't pay attention to me. Because every single time that curve inverts, uh, we got a problem. The best measure of the curve, at least as a predictor of future recession, is the difference between 10-year Treasury yields and three-month Treasury bill yields. Uh, that difference today is about 20, 25 basis points. So uh, we need to watch that very carefully. And the, the intuition behind it is if the curve inverts, long, short rates rise above long rates, it goes back to credit growth. The, the banking system, the financial system can't make any money, right, because their margin, their net interest margin, the difference between uh, the cost of their funds, which is close to short-term rates, and the yields they get on the loans they make, long-term rates, if that inverts, they, their interest margin goes flat or negative, they can't make money, 
and therefore credit is restricted, and you don't get the credit flows that you normally see, and that's particularly difficult if it comes after a period of, of particularly strong credit growth and recessions and so. The average length of time between an inversion of the yield curve and recession is one year, one year. So if summer of 2020 is going to be recession, that would suggest that the 10-year, three-month bill yield should invert by summer of this year. We're 20 basis points away. Okay, I'll give you one more indicator to watch. There's, there's, there's actually a panoply of indicators to watch. But I'll give you a third one, and this is the best contemporaneous indicator of recession. Uh, and contemporaneous is pretty good, right? Because uh, if, you, if you can recall, if you remember back to past recessions, you, we don't even know when we're in a recession, right? We debate it, endlessly debate it. And because you, the, 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 you know, the economic data is always kind of floggy, but the fog is really thick when the economy is at a turning point, particularly when it's going into recession. You don't even know it. The surveys that we use to capture what's going on in the economy and labor market aren't nearly as good at turning points. So a, a good contemporaneous indicator is, is nearly as good as a leading indicator because you know it's proof positive in your recession. And the best uh, contemporaneous indicator of recession is when the unemployment rate rises by more than a quarter percentage point in a three-month period. More than a quarter percentage point in a three-month period. We've had 10 recessions since World War II. Every recession that we've had of those 10 has, has, been, uh, has occurred at the time when that actually occurred, when the unemployment rate rose by more, more than a quarter point in a three-month period. Reason being, that's proof positive that we're in that vicious cycle, right? Unemployment is now rising too fast for people to get their minds around. They're starting to get panicked. They pull back. Confidence falls, and we're in that economic kind of downturn. Okay. Now, there are two preconditions for recession, necessary conditions. Uh, necessary condition number one, the economy has to overheat, right? You have to go past full employment. That's a, that's a feature of every, at the end of every business cycle. Unemployment falls, wage growth picks up, ultimately inflationary pressures develop, interest rates rise, and that exposes problems in the economy, and economy slows and you, and you go into recession. That necessary condition is, in my view, roughly satisfied. And remember, we're at a 4% unemployment rate headed to 35 and, and full employment unemployment rate is 4 and a half. The second necessary condition for recession is that uh, there has to be some major imbalance in the economy that's mirrored in the financial system. And the best way to describe this is by example. So the financial crisis 10 years ago, that, that's pretty clear, housing, subprime mortgage. We had, we had a boatload of problems, but that was at core what, what drove that, that, that financial crisis. 2000-2001, uh, that was what I mentioned earlier, the internet boom, the equity bubble, the equity bubble burst, and then we had a recession in 2000-2001. I'll go back one more. Recession, 1990-1991, do you remember that? That was uh, Michael Milken. That was junk corporate bonds. That was CRE, and that was savings and loans. The savings and loan industry, it's hard to remember the savings and loan industry, but the savings and loan industry was uh, unfettered by a piece of legislation in the 1980s, and you got all these fly-by-night uh, guys come in, take over these SNLs, and just took on all this kind of risk, and it all blew up and ended up in the night. So I can go back to every recession since World War II, the 10 of them, and at least ex post identify what was at the heart of that recession. It's a lot harder to do that ex ante going forward, uh, but I'll try. Uh, and I mentioned it's not going to be in the household sector, uh, to Matt's point. That's where the problem was last time, therefore it's not going to be the problem this time. All the guys that ran the uh, consumer finance companies, the credit card companies, the mortgage companies, you know, they don't, they don't forget what happened very easily, and they respond very rapidly to any erosion in underlying uh, credit quality. Take the subprime vehicle lenders. As soon as there was a problem there, they tightened up on their underwriting, and uh, that uh, uh, loan growth there slowed and credit quality has improved. Now, the problem is, as I think Matt kind of alluded to, and there's been a lot of discussion uh, in the room, is around leverage lending. Uh, lending to businesses, non-financial corporates that are uh, already highly leveraged, below investment grade corporates. Um, just, to, just to give you a sense of the numbers, uh, if you go back uh, five years ago, there was uh, approximately $700 billion in leveraged loans outstanding. Today, five years later, there's close to, according to Moody's, 
data $1.5 trillion in leverage loans out of state in a five-year period, more than a doubling. You know that old banking adage? If it's growing like a weed, it's probably a weed. It's probably a weed. A lot of that growth, uh, about half of all leveraged loans go into CLOs, collateralized loan obligations. So what happens is a CLO manager, an investment manager, goes out, buys these loans from banks and non-banking institutions, puts them into a trust, issues a security based on the cash flow generated by those, those loans and sells it off to global investors. Sound, sound familiar? Sound familiar? CLOs account for half of all leveraged loans outstanding. The growth in the CLO market in the last year through December of 2018, this is Moody's data, we rate all the CLOs and we rate all of the loans that go into the CLOs, was up 30% from a year earlier. 30% growth in one year. Strongest growth was in healthcare, pharma, telecom, technology, leisure hospitality, media, and believe it or not, even con construction industry, a lot of uh, leverage lending in the highly cyclical business. Um, here's the other thing. Um, there's, if you're a business, a non-financial corporate, you can go out and borrow in the loan market, or obviously you can issue a bond, a junk corporate bond, a below investment grade bond. And there's now $1.3 trillion in high yield debt outstanding. So I add up $1.5 trillion in leveraged loans plus $1.3 trillion in high yield debt, corporate debt, bonds. That's $2.8 trillion in total debt outstanding to the non-financial corporate sector, to these companies, these guys at the tail of the distribution, the leverage, the, the leverage companies. For context, at the peak of the subprime mortgage boom, there was $3 trillion in subprime mortgage. One more thing. I mentioned that the leveraged loan market is 1.5 trillion in total size, and about half of those loans go into CLOs. That means the other half goes somewhere else. Thing is, nobody knows where they go and has no idea about those loans. Moody's, because we rate the, the uh, loans that go into the CLOs, we know everything about those loans, right? We know everything about those loans. We know everything about the CLO. But if it doesn't go into a CLO, we have no idea about those loans. You know, what the covenants are, how they're structured, you know, what the, the leverage is of the companies that are issuing, issuing the loans. Uh, and, and nobody else knows either. Nobody, it's a very opaque market, no transparency around that market. And, you know, maybe things are going okay in that market, but, you know, if there's no light on the market, generally things are going off the rails. So I, you know, this sounds pretty bleak and dark, and it's certainly, I think, at a point where we need to start throwing up some yellow flares. I'm not sure we're at, we're at red flares yet, uh, but if this continues for another year, another two years, then I do think uh, this would likely be at the center of the next economic downturn or recession. So when's the next recession? June 2020. June 20th, 2020. <laughs> Why? It's the solstice. No, it, you know, I don't know. I really don't. But here's, here's the way I, if I were talking to a chief risk officer of SunTrust, the way I would put it is, uh, there's probably more, greater than even odds that there will be an economic downturn starting at some point between now and the end of 2020. That's the kind of risk that, that we face. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. I covered uh, all the ground that I'd like to. I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, see where you wanna take the conversation. I think we have a few more minutes. What's bugging you? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what? so, you know, telling him the exact day of the recession wasn't enough. <laughs> well, now he wants to know everything about the next recession. How deep is it going to be? How long is it going to be? What's going to happen to my house value? When's it going to, you know, yeah, he wants to know everything. I thought I was very impressive, you know, giving you a day, but, you know, we're beyond that. We're beyond that. Um, 
I'd say a couple things. First, it feels more like a typical garden variety recession, not a financial crisis, uh, not the Great Recession. Uh, I do think that leverage lending is a problem and probably will be at the center of the next downturn. Uh, but I don't think it'll take out the financial system, um, in part because of something I said earlier, the banking system is in very good shape, highly capitalized, very liquid, stressed. We had a CCAR stress test start yesterday. The Fed released the CCAR stress test for 2019. And if you look at the triple B treasury spread, it's, they gap it out in the stress test. And the reason they're doing that is because they're stressing the leveraged loan portfolios of the banking system. They know this is a risk and they're gonna make the banks capitalize to a severe leveraged loan driven kind of economic downturn. Uh, so I don't think it takes out the financial system. And if it doesn't take out the financial system, then you don't have a great recession like we had 10 years ago. You don't have a financial crisis like you have a garden variety kind of typical downturn where unemployment rises three percentage points, not, you know, it doesn't, you know, last time it went from five to 10, this one might go from three and a half to six and a half, you know, something like that, which is, you know, painful, but it's not cataclysmic. So that's the first thing I'd say. And I say there is some concern about does the Federal Reserve and uh, fiscal policymakers, the president and Congress have enough uh, firepower to respond? And I say the answer is probably yes. Um, you know, the Fed, you know, probably will have the funds rate around 3% by the time the recession hits. The average decline in the funds rate in a recession is about three points, maybe around. And then they'll go to QE, drive down long-term interest rates. And they're getting much more comfortable about using QE as a tool, both now in trying to slow the economy, or to sub help support the economy and also to slow the economy. Um, so I think that's the most likely scenario. But I'll throw in two things that worry me uh, that uh, could change the character of the next recession. One is uh, the shadow financial system. So when I think about the financial system, I think about the, the in my simplistic uh, vision of it, it's the banking system, depository institutions. That's half of credit, the credit provision. And the other half is the shadow system, non-banks. You know, mezzanine debt funds, private equity. You know, Moody's is in the shadow system. You know, we are the shadow. You know, we are, you know, we run the shadow system, you know, yeah, we're there. Or we think we are, we think we do, until we don't. Uh, yeah. um, the shadow system's problem isn't capital. There aren't like big SIFI, systemically important financial institutions. There are a few, but I'm not worried about them. It's really about liquidity. So you have a lot of these small players that rely on the big banks for lines of credit. They rely on JP Morgan or SunTrust I think BB&T is the largest mortgage aware wholesale lender in the country, for example, right? So all those non-banks that are making FHA, VA, USD loans get their warehouse lines from BB&T, as an example. Or short-term funding markets, repo markets, right? Those, mar those lines of credit, if you get in a risk-off, a true risk-off environment, those, JB, Jamie Dimon is not gonna, he's gonna immediately cut off those lines, not renew them, right? The repo market, as you know, shuts off instantly. It's open, like, literally now. Next second, it's not open. Yeah. And so what do those guys do? And what happens to the... So I, you could get into a liquidity event. Liquidity events are actually quite scary, which we did see in the financial crisis. And the only way you get out of a liquidity event is that the Federal Reserve can come into the system and provide liquidity. But they actually have less latitude to do that post Dodd-Frank because of changes to their room, room to maneuver in Dodd-Frank. They'll figure it out. They'll eventually come in. But it'll take a while. So you could be feeling very, like the floor is dropped out. And it could be a very V-shaped kind of recession. So that's one thing I worry about. The other thing I worry about is uh, we live in a global economy. And I said, uh, you know, the US policymakers have room to maneuver, but the rest of the world does not. Take Europe. In my view, the European debt crisis is long, has a long way to go from being over. They got a lot of work to do, and Brexit's just the next step. And they have no space. The ECB, European Central Bank, has a negative interest rate. And if we, in a, if we get into a 2020 recession, there's still a negative interest rate. They've used QE up to the max. Now, now they'll have to start buying Picasso paintings, you know, like the, like the Jap Japanese, because they've run out of sovereign debt to buy. Uh, and there's no fiscal space. That's the Italians. The Italians at 130 to debt to GDP. They have zero fiscal space. As soon as they say they want to spend a penny, their, their tenure uh, the yield jumps. They have no fiscal space. 
You know, the French, the Spanish, pretty close. The only people, have, the only uh, European country has any fiscal space whatsoever is the Germans. And of course, the German Union will never spend the fiscal space. You know, they'll never do it. So I worry about Europe getting, and of course, their political problem, we think we got political problems. They got huge political, go look at the lunatics in Italy, right? Or AFD in Germany, or, you know, uh, the Spain, Spanish have like two or three crazy parties. I uh, can't keep track of them. So, you know, you can easily see that coming off the rails. And then what? And then what? So I think it's garden variety, but, you know, there's um, certainly, I have no problem, correct, uh, 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 as you can see, I have that zero problem constructing a stress scenario for you, uh, you know, out there on the tail. Yeah. Hi, thanks for uh, talking about some of the stresses that you see. Uh, one of the things you haven't really mentioned is that transformation of the Fed in the last 15 days from a institution that was going to raise rates to instill discipline to an institution that's going to just provide whatever the market needs. Can you talk about what's happening with the Democratic takeover of the House and the change in politics in the United States towards more less capitalistic uh, friendly to more socialist friendly and how that's going to impact the next couple of years and also what the Fed is doing now beyond their original mandate of traits and uh, inflation. Right, right. It always is. No doubt in my own mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I think you asked essentially two questions. Um, and the first is around the Federal Reserve and sort of how policy has changed there over the last few months. And then the second is around our, uh, the, the politics the, around economic policy, particularly as we're getting a sense of what the Democratic candidates are, are going to start proposing. So with regard to monetary policy, I, I, um, I concur with you. I'm a little perplexed by uh, what seems to be a rather sharp shift in the way they're conducting policy. If you go back, you know, back last fall in October, uh, you had Chair, uh, Chairman Powell talking about the fact that interest rates were still a long way from equilibrium, meaning I'm gonna have to, we're gonna have to raise rates a lot, you know, going forward. And then here we are, fast forward to early this year, and now they feel like they're on indefinite pause, right? They, they're not even saying the risks are to higher interest rates here. That's a pretty big shift in a pretty short period of time. And obviously, they're, they're responding to what's going on around them. And I'm not arguing that they shouldn't adjust to that. I mean, the equity market peaked in October. I remember December 24th, the S&P 500 was down 20%. That was a bear market. And, you know, they saw that. Credit spreads gapped out. Um, you know, of course, they. this was when the... Uh, shutdown was in full swing. It looked like this function was very, very significant. And then they, uh, more fundamentally, and I, they're right, I mean, inflation is still low, and inflation expectations are very well anchored, you know, around 2%. So that gives them latitude. That goes to my point, they have latitude. So I'm not, I wouldn't take umbrage, umbrage is a good SAT word, I wouldn't argue with um, their, you know, kind of adjustment in policy. But you're right, that was a pretty sharp, a pretty significant change. And I think actually to the point where it's now become counterproductive again because financial conditions have completely improved. The S&P 500, even today, down 1%, but it's still only 4 or 5% now from the peak. The peak is in view. Credit spreads have come right back in. The risk-off environment that we we're in seems to be melting away into more of a risk-on environment. So they, and you still have an economy creating 200,000 jobs per month. That's a lot of jobs, and wage growth is accelerating. So my sense is that he's going to be having to come right back and start pressing the brakes again. He may have to press them a lot harder. This goes, back, this goes back to my point. Landing the economic plane is really difficult to do, and you can see it in real time right here. This is really hard to do, and I, and I suspect he's not getting it quite right. Uh, and thus the odds that he's going to crash land the plane as we, you know, we go into 2020. With regard to uh, the policies of the Democratic candidates. Um, and, I, and I should just let you know, I'm a Democrat. I'm a, I'm a Democrat. Uh, 
I'm not a, my wife's a lunatic Democrat. Uh, you know. I mean, she reads the New York Times every day, and every day I walk in the door and I hear every op-ed. She's one of the, she's, God bless her, you know, we've been married 30, 30 years. She every day calls up Pat Toomey, who's my senator, Republican senator, and moans. Uh, you know, to, they don't even pick up the phone anymore in the Toomey office. Um, oh, was Andy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so you should just know that. Um, but I'm not comfortable with it either. Um, I think it's a reaction to the policies that the Trump administration is, are pursuing. And it's, I think Matt did a really good job with the Pac-Man on both sides. I think that's exactly right. By the way, how many people know about Pac-Man? Yeah. <laughs> really? We're an old bunch, I think. Yeah. This is an old group. Yeah. I'm not sure my son would know Pac-Man. Or do they? I don't know. They know everything. Um, so uh, I think it's a, uh, a reaction to. Now, I'm hopeful that it's a rhetorical reaction to and uh, ultimately will spend itself in the election process. And in fact, that's the beauty of the American system. We allow for these voices to be voiced. This is the whole point. Let, let, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let them get out there. And let's really test, stress test all these ideas. And you know, it makes for a better process. You know, I, I actually, am, I'm an economist, but I'm very active in uh, policy making, particularly around mortgage finance. And so I've seen GSC, re, there's this, for 10 years, the last thing that needs to be solved coming up for, from the last financial crisis was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? That's come back up. So I've spent, this is a parlor game for me. For 10 years, all I've been doing is thinking about GSC reform. It's a beautiful thing for me, right? Because it's economics, it's finance, it's politics. Um, you know, it's a marriage of all these things that are really interesting. But of course, frustrating because nothing's happened for 10 years. But I will say this, it's, we have made significant advances in our understanding of the mortgage finance system because of the debates we've had for the last 10 years. We have gone down every single path on how to reform Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Every path has led to a dead end, but by going down the path, we gain understanding, mutual understanding, right? The, the folks, I talk to the, I'm a Democrat, so I, but I talk to the staffers of, of Senator Crapo of Idaho, who's running the Senate Banking Committee because he's leading the way on GSG reform. And I'm there to help them. You know, I don't agree with what they're doing, but I view it as my responsibility to help them do the best that they can do with the idea that they need to pursue given the political situation and politics that they have. It's that there's, old, there's an old Winston Churchill saying about Americans, right? I can't, I'll botch it, but Americans try everything and they'll ultimately do the right thing. Ultimately do the right thing. So I view this last few years and the next couple of years coming forward as us trying everything and ultimately we will do the right thing, in my view, in my view. So maybe we'll have a recession in 2020, but I am very bullish on the American economy. By the way, never bet in a consistent long-term way against our economy because it is an amazing thing just as long as we don't, you know, screw up what is, makes it the most amazing. But even that's going to be hard to do. So I, I hear you on these proposals. I'm not comfortable with a 2% wealth tax that's half-baked. I'm not comfortable with going back to a 70% income tax on high income households. I think that's pretty obviously, you go back to history, there's debate, but that just doesn't make sense, in my view. So, but let's have the discussion, let's have the debate. Let's, let's work through the numbers and we'll, you know, I think we'll, we'll come out in a better place as a result. And let's all hope that we get a, a, a more moderate uh, Democrat uh, entering into the race. I think we will, I think we will. Yes, sir. Back to a more uh, economic question. Uh, nine months ago, Procter & Gamble announced they were gonna raise prices uh, four to five percent and did. Six weeks later, Colgate announced they were gonna raise prices three to four percent and did. Interest rates are up. Uh, employment uh, wage growth is up. Inflation is two percent. Why, how can those two sets of situations uh, be rationalized and why don't we have two and a half percent or three percent or four percent inflation? Yeah, it's a great question. A lot of debate about that. Um, 
First thing I'll say is this acceleration in wage growth is relatively new uh, over the last two years or so. Uh, and even with the acceleration in wage growth, we've also observed a acceleration in productivity growth. So unit labor costs, that's the cost per unit of output. That's what really matters for businesses' profit margins and ultimately the prices they charge for their goods and services, has risen, but not nearly as much as you would think. It's still within a range that has prevailed for the last 10 years. I, I think that's going to change. I think wage growth will outpace productivity growth and we'll see inflationary pressures develop. But so, so far, that has not been the case. So that's first important fact. Second, inflation expectations, which I mentioned earlier, are very well anchored, meaning no matter what's going on with actual inflation, people think, investors think, business people think, that inflation is going to be 2%. Economists think it's going to be 2%. And that's a very strong anchor on uh, of price pressures more broadly. Uh, you know, if you think it's going to be 2%, you're, you know, everything is kind of geared around. I don't know about your business, but I, 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 I employ uh, 200 economists across the globe, and I set their wages and their bonuses, obviously with a lot of help from the mothership, you know, the Moody's. But you start with 2%, right? The wage increase that you have sitting in your you know, work-wise uh, spreadsheet is 2%. So uh, that goes back to inflation expectations. So that provides a, a big anchor. Here's the third thing, though, I'd say. And this is, I think, not well understood and open to some debate. Uh, but I think it's true. I actually think the tax cut has depressed uh, price inflation temporarily because businesses are able to use the increase in their after-tax margin to cushion the blow from their rise, the, the costs, the rising costs that they have. Uh, and I say this now as a, um, a board member of MGIC. MGIC sets, you know, the way we make, do we, our, our business is uh, providing mortgage insurance for default and we set a premium for providing that insurance. And uh, soon after the tax cut, obviously our after-tax return on equity or return on assets jumped, right? We went from a 35% tax rate to a 21% tax rate. And so our ROE, are, in fact, you know, it's a, it's a very profitable business when there's no defaults, right? You're minting, you're minting cash. So it's a very competitive business because it, it's, it's a, homo, a homogeneous product. And so the MI companies, the mortgage insurers, uh, competed away that premium increase. We cut premiums. I mean, excuse me. We competed away that tax cut by lowering insurance premiums. So we actually lowered price. We actually lowered price to home buyers, right? We, we actually lowered price. So in my view, my sense is that this tax cut is having, has had that effect more broadly across companies. You know, of course, they've used it for share repurchase. They've used the tax benefits for dividend repayment. But my sense is they also, have also used it to restrain their price increases. If that theory is true, then that suggests as the tax benefits wear off, because that is a one-time windfall, we're not getting that back again, then uh, that goes away and the, wage, the stronger wage growth will, will take over and we'll see inflation pick up. And that goes to my expectation that the Federal Reserve will be raising interest rates before the year is over, not cutting interest rates. But that, that, that's, that's, that's Zandy's pet theory as to what's going on. I can give you more re reasons, uh, but those would be my top three. Yeah. Hey, good evening. Uh, thanks for your insights. Um, I have a multi-part question. Uh, first, uh, you know, discuss, you discussed a little bit about uh, the monetary policy. He's got a, he's got a book there. It's really I'm getting <laughs> nervous. Yeah, yeah. How, how many? How many multi-parts? Yeah. Just three. Okay, go ahead. All right. In terms of the monetary policy, first talked about uh, Fed increasing interest rates. Can you please discuss a little bit about quantitative tightening and how potentially that's impacting the economy? If you think you know, that's having a big impact. I think there's a lot of uh, different analysis and opinions out there in terms of how much of an impact it's having. Yeah. Uh, secondarily, um, how do you view uh, the underemployment rate versus the, just the employment rate? Um, you know, I think that could potentially be a, a better measure in terms of, of what the economy is experiencing in terms of, of, uh, of, of growth. And then, and then lastly, um, in terms of Moody's, uh, I know historically, uh, they've been somewhat criticized for having a backward um, view as looking 
has, has Moody's changed their policy and, and how's that impacting credit, credit ratings? Wow, okay. Um, so on quantitative tightening, it has had an impact, uh, but small. So here's a rule of thumb. Uh, every one percentage point to GDP change in the Fed's balance sheet changes long-term interest rates by four basis points. So given the winding down of the Fed's balance sheet since the end of uh, QE, that's probably added, by my calculation, 10 to 15 basis points to long-term interest rates, all else being equal. So small. Uh, you know, it has added to, although, I mean, of course, rates are still very low, so there's lots of things driving rates down, but all else being equal, Q, Q, QT, quantitative tightening, has added 10 to 15 basis points to long-term rates. That's pretty consistent with Fed research on this as well, and that's, that's consistent with the, re I've done research in this area, and that's consistent, that's, that's, that, those are my numbers, but it's consistent with Fed research. On uh, underemployment, I, I hear you, I get, I get what you're saying. Um, but underemployment is also falling very rapidly. The best broad measure of slack in the labor market is the percent of prime age workers that are not working. Think about that for a second. Percent of prime age workers not working for whatever reason. Unemployed, disabled, in school, playing Pac-Man, uh, opioid, incarceration, and that is, uh, that is now back very close to the lows that we've seen in past business cycles. We have a little bit, you know, we might be 10 or 20 basis points higher than the low points, but there's also been a long run secular increase in that as well. So yeah, maybe, you know, there's a little more slack out there than I think, but not that much. And if I look at that measure of slack relative to wage growth and compare that to history, that's the Phillips wage curve, the current wage growth is very consistent with the amount of slack in the labor market. So, you know, I think that's a marginal point uh, at this point. Although I will say there's endless debate about that, even in my own shop. I have, you know, a lot of economists and, and I've got mo many of them arguing with me about this. I will not, I will not relent though, uh, I will not relent. Um, on Moody's, you make, you know, you're right, I, uh, um, there has been a lot of changes post-crisis. Um, I mean, one of the biggest changes is, seems pretty obvious, and this, people have a hard time believing this, but um, Moody's policy was that we would not underwrite uh, the mortgage loans that went into the mortgage securities. We took the information as given to us by the investment banks. Everyone knew there was fraud, but that wasn't our problem. That, believe it or not, was the view. Uh, obviously, that was a stupid. Uh, and now, all, all, anything that we're rated, they're, they, they're basically we, we underwrite, you know, randomly sampled kind of underwriting. So that's an example of some of the uh, change. Also, it's much more forward looking, right? They bought my, I, I, had, I, I, I wasn't born at Moody's. I had my own company, an economic consulting firm. I sold it to Moody's you know, right before the crisis, and they bought me because they knew they were not forward-looking enough. They were looking backwards, and so they wanted more forward-looking, and now there's a, a very rigorous process of trying to incorporate forward-looking forecasts into the work that they do, the rating agency does. Having said all of that, we're still gonna screw up, um, you know, but it's the nature of the game. Anytime you f you're looking, you're trying to make some a prediction expectation about what's going to happen in the future, there's going to be some mess up somewhere. So we just, you know, be prepared. We have to be prepared for it. Um, and the final thing I'll say is, even though the rating agency model is not, it's got its flaws, obviously, but the problem is no one can come up with a better flawed model. Um, you know, we've tried. Yeah. I think everyone would be all ears if we could figure it out. Okay, I'm getting tired. Do we, do we have time for one more question, or do you guys want to call it quits? One more? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be quick. It's been one more. Um, <laughs> I heard Janet Yellen speak at a conference recently, and she made the statement that the Fed believes the speed limit for the economy is 2% growth, and if it goes above that, the economy will overheat. Do you agree with that, and why do they believe that? 
I do believe that. Uh, the uh, the uh, speed limit, as you say, or the potential growth rate of the economy is equal to the sum of the productivity growth of the economy and the growth in the labor force. And uh, currently, um, productivity growth is between one and one and a half percent, and labor force growth is between a half and one percent. And here's the thing, for us to maintain 2% growth, given the demographic fact that the boomers are retiring and labor force growth is going to slow unless we increase immigration. If we, if we simply assume immigration going forward as we've had in the past, which might be a tall assumption, but let's assume it, given the fact that my cohort, my demographic is retiring en masse over the next 10 to 15 years, labor force growth is going to go from a half to, a half to one point to zero to a half a point. So we need to maintain 2% growth we're, to even maintain it over the next 10, 15 years, we're going to need to see productivity growth accelerate, which I think we should be able to do because productivity growth is low relative to historical standards. And you listen to Mark Cuban, and he talks about AI and machine learning. So it's got to be you know, the case that we're going to see increase in productivity growth. But that's a forecast. Having said all of that, that is not written in stone, right? You can raise the speed limit of the economy, the potential growth of the economy. How would you do it? Well, on the labor force side, what's the most obvious way to do it? Increase immigration. We need more immigrants, not fewer immigrants, right? Of course, we want highly skilled, educated, but I'll tell you what, we have a labor shortage across all skill levels. If President Trump wants to build the wall between, this is the Democrat coming out in me, between the US and Mexico, he's gonna have to hire Mexican workers to build it, right? Because there are no Workers, construction workers, they can't build in Texas. They literally cannot build in Texas. There's no workers, none, construction workers. So we need all kinds, and given the demographic. How's the, and now it turned to productivity growth, which is harder. How would you do that? I don't think the answer is cutting corporate tax rates from 35 to 21. I could see cutting them from 35 to 28. But cutting them from 35 to 21, all you're doing is adding to the deficit, and that washes out the benefit of the world. So how would you do it? The most obvious thing in the world to me is infrastructure. I mean, you know, we would unlock all of the potential that exists in parts of our country. Go, go to rural Georgia, go to rural Pennsylvania, go to the, you know, Michigan and Illinois and Ohio. You know, they don't have the infrastructure. We've got it here, and you can see it. This is beautiful, right, in Atlanta. Although, I don't know, your road systems are crazy here. And <laughs> I tried to walk from the Omni over here. I, I nearly took my life in my own hands. I go, this is a nice day. You know, I live in Pennsylvania. I'm going to take advantage of this 80 degree weather. I go, what did I just decide to do here? You know, it's crazy. You need to build like sidewalks, you know? Uh, yeah. So uh, that's what I would do. Uh, and there, I, you know, I can go on forever, but those are the kinds of things I would do. But the, the answer is yes, unless we change policy, 2% is, is, is the speed limit. Yeah. Thank you very much, thank you.